Okay, so uh, rather than face to face, you're stuck with a uh, video lecture. Um, just so you don't miss out on this week's learning. There's a few things I want to show you, but um, what we're going to start with is just a little look about where we are. Uh, we've covered the theory of Maxwell and Masters reinvestment theory and, and kind of what it is. What I want to look at this week is a bit more about how you would uh, do something in coaching that would prevent people suffering uh, uh, in a choke situation. Uh, here are plenty of readings that you can look at, um, most of which are quite well written. Um, the other thing I'm going to make available is uh, a lecture by Masters. Um, I think that's visible already, so I'll leave it as it is. Right, before we do anything else, let's look at some film nostalgia. So let's just go with a bit of tin cup. Good. Every morning, a brand new tax. Sneak a few in the bag when you get a chance. We swipe enough free shit, we might even pay for this fiasco. Now, you think it'd be an inappropriate if I asked Lee Johnson for his autograph? I think that's a dead giveaway, Rose, but if I still got the shanks, we're going to be found out soon enough. Seven. Oh, I said that good. Good thinking, Pa. Sweet swing. Come on, man. Keep your head down and follow through. You're making me nervous. Whoa. Hey, who hit that shot? Yeah, who hit that? Anybody see? There's supposed to be pros here. <laughs> A little thin, boss. A little fucking thin. Surprised to got the shanks. Don't worry about it, man. He's watching me. Nobody's watching. Just get another one. Come on. Just stand up there, man. You can do it. Oh, yeah. Hey, oh. partner, uh, you know, the guys down the line are a little concerned about that. What's your name? Tin Cup? Yeah, Roy McAvoy. West Texas. We're off in West Texas. Uh, why don't you try aiming a little left and you Why might... don't you try backing well, up? Give me just a little room. Miller. A flying fuck who it is. Jesus Christ. You can't do that. Hey, no problem. What do you want to? Uh, to Roman. Roman uh, my best friend. Good luck to you guys. You might want to make some plane reservations Friday, though. The okay, thanks, Mr. Miller. Hey, great opening to 73, boy. <laughs> okay, thanks. What a nice guy, man. Yeah. Did you get his autograph? Yeah, look. My best friend. Okay. You see who's over there? Yeah. Jesus Christ. It's an autograph, man. Sims is here. Maybe she hit your butter, you can't shank that one. Look, if you're the Mexican Mac O'Grady, you gotta figure out why I'm still shanking the ball. You know. Now, what's the problem? Shh. I'm catching on the hosel, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Moving my head? Yeah. I'm laying it off? Well, that too. I'm pronating? When you're not supinating. I'm clearing too early. I'm clearing too late. My God, my swing feels like an unfolding lawn chair. All right. Take all your change and put it in your left-hand pocket. Go on, do it, Roy. Uh -huh. Tie your left shoe in a double knot. Tie my left shoe. Right now, Roy, do it. Turn your hat around backwards. Turn your hat around. Do it, Roy. Now take this T and stick it behind your left ear. Stick it. I look like a fool. What the hell do you think you look like shooting them chili peppers up Lee Jansen's ass? And you do it right now, Roy. I swear to God, I want to quit. I swear to God. I'll All right. Quit. All right, good. Now take this little ball, hit it the hell up the fairway. You're ready. How'd I do that? Because you're not thinking about shanking. You're not thinking about the doctor lady. You're not thinking, period. You're just looking like a fool, and you're hitting the ball pure and simple. And that's your name. Fuck me, huh? Well, you're cured. That's it? Yeah, that's it. 
Your brain was getting in the way. Hardly ever been the case, but... Well, Slightly flippant, I know, but um, that wasn't too loud coming in after the quiet video. Make anyone jump or spill their tea. Right, the thing about that, as you probably guessed, is it's a, it's a way of saying that people choke. It, it manifests itself in different sports. In, in golf, uh, you've got two, you've got shanking it, but you've also got uh, the yips. It's just your brain getting in the way where you're trying to overthink what you're doing. And, and that's the basic principle of, of, of um, reinvestment. So just just to re, uh, uh, revisit what we looked at last week, uh, it's an observable phenomenon in, in sports at all levels. Uh, we see it happen uh, writ large in, in all of, of sport as we watch it on TV. Uh, some of us have experienced it ourselves. And quite often it's on uh, what should be easy or relatively easy, well-controlled, but um, specific movements like a serve in tennis or like a putt in golf. It's rarely something that happens in what I would call midstream. Um, so what it isn't is an athlete varying under, under any kind of other pressure. Uh, the pressure itself causes athletes to attempt to cognitive, cognitively control automated movements or movements that should be automated. And Masters and Maxwell would say this is called reinvestment. And this prevents us uh, uh, moving effectively. So this idea that attempting to consciously monitor uh, and control a well-learned motor program definitely reduces skill efficiency. Uh, it's a bit like asking somebody whether they breathe in or out at the top of their backswing in golf. Yeah, it's, it makes them think about it. So if you really want to put your opponent off, especially if you're a tennis player, start asking them really technical questions or, or golf as well. Start asking them really technical questions about their, their swing and how they do certain things. That will make them concentrate on it. And then the theory would say that they're less likely to do it. But well, penalty would also be a good one. So what happens there, they suggest, is that verbal, verbally based instructions flood working memory and therefore we don't have the correct capacity for cue processing, which is processing the information that we need from the environment. The other thing that happens is we interrupt established kinetic chains with verbal information and verbal can never truly describe movement in an effective way. So there are two solutions which we briefly touched on last week. Uh, you can treat this which is sports psychology. We need to block the athlete from accessing their repository um, of stored verbal knowledge. Um, and we can do that by either distracting them, perhaps, um, and, and in which case we would make them concentrate on something else. Um, but that doesn't really, what I would call, argue in any kind of sense that that would help us. Uh, is, you don't want to be distracted. So what we can do is we can do some sort of relaxation. We can use self-talk or imagery, especially uh, a pre-performance routine that manages the concentration of an athlete as they're about to perform a skill through to having performed it such that there is less chance of them doing silly things verbally with self-talk. Um, functional self-talk would be uh, deliberately making them say things in their heads such that they, can, they can't then use that channel for verbal information. The other way, which seems much more appropriate, is we would prevent them. Um, so what we would do is either stop them and, and not give them verbal information as they're learning, uh, in which case they wouldn't therefore have the verbal repository in their, in their brain to go back to under situations that might then cause a choke. So what we're doing in the early stages of learning is constraining this learning environment. And what that does is it reduces the verbal information. Uh, this makes sense uh, in terms of reinvestment theory. They say, as you reinvest, you reinvest verbally, particularly uh, to information that was learned verbally in the cognitive stage of learning, that, that fits in Posner stage. And therefore it's theoretically derived, this should work. But 
what what's important is perhaps how we do this in coaching so looking at it from a much more pragmatic point of view rather than theoretical would be helpful so motor learning the classic fits and posner idea 67 suggests that people go through a cognitive associates autonomous stage this kind of linear way i mean we can critique that for all we like in in other in other ways of thinking but uh it seems to marry particularly well with with reinvestment theory in the cognitive phase what we do is we lay down these instructions um they have to be quite simple skills um and we build up this store of information about how to perform a particular thing however there's no reason that this store of information has to be verbal it can be kinesthetic it can be verbal sorry visual um, and reinvestment theory would say that actually when we are under if we're if we're prone to choking or if you find a situation that's going to make us likely to choke we actually regress our learning to the cognitive stage masters and maxwell suggested that there are other ways to learning and we should as coaches definitely uh, emphasize those as we teach beginners as well as that there's this idea of explicit and implicit so an explicit way would be where you the learner and either coach would be focused on the same thing and, and either coach would be orientating you towards it and we would work specifically on it in a very explicit way there are other ways that you can pick up uh, learning especially movement um and if you think back to well as we move towards an autonomous stage we would make some of the explicit stuff implicit anyway uh, we don't we no longer think about tying our shoelaces uh, if you've been driving for more than a few you know a couple of years you don't really think about changing gear you don't think about the clutch going down you just change gear it's, it's part of one process so that happens anyway but what masters and maxwell were suggesting that uh, is that it should be possible to teach them entirely using an implicit pathway and if that's true then that information is not actually available to the player at any point and therefore they would suggest it's, it's less likely that they would choke so implicit and explicit pathways implicit learning is has the advantages of that it's it's independent of any kind of other learning ability uh, everyone can learn to move um, it contains a lot of motor information that it would be very very difficult to uh, describe in, in a verbal function so it might be more effective it does seem to be resistant to psychological stress and in, in particular some brain dysfunction so actually people who have uh, say uh, brain injuries still remember well-learned routines even after either brain surgery or, or, or surgery for epilepsy or something like that. Um, so it does seem to be quite resistant to trauma. It's less likely that we forget. So they say you never forget how to ride a bike, but I'm sure if you thought, okay, I'm gonna to describe to you precisely how to ride a bike, that's a very difficult thing. Um, you could also argue that you don't forget how to drive having done it for a bit but once again you wouldn't necessarily think about describing how to drive a car uh, as being a good way to learn uh, the other thing is it seems to be uh, in, in some of the papers that are on Moodle uh, resistant to fatigue Ex explicit learning however is this motor information that, that we can describe however because it's verbal um we can forget it it degrades and it interrupts and then we and, and it also we need to be explicit in the way that we we emphasize and, and, and implement it so we have um we need to process it in working memory unlike implicit which just sort of happens subconsciously three types of implicit learning technique uh, are suggested each of which i think is looked at in the uh, in the papers on Moodle is dual task learning, uh, errorless learning, uh, particularly for beginners, and then analogy learning, most of which, uh, most of us which do that to some extent in our sport. Um, so what we're going to look at is what they, uh, what these are and, and whether there's any evidence for either of these, and then hopefully apply these to the coaching context. 
I realize I'm going quite fast, but there's always the opportunity in this medium that you can replay. So dual task learning. Um, this is where you try to effectively distract a player. So what you're trying to do is make them think of something else whilst giving them the learning uh, target skill. To some extent, I think this is, you could do things like movement to numbers or movement to music. Um, you could get them to say things to themselves like a team mantra or something like that whilst they're go are going over and over and over again. As, as we know, uh, in order to refine a movement uh, or a technique, you need to do it uh, many hundreds or thousands of times. But perhaps you don't need to explicitly uh, concentrate on doing it. If you, could, if you could go through that process without necessarily thinking about it, you would still learn it implicitly. So Brighton Friedman, Friedman had uh, this uh, experiment with golf putting. And what they wanted was that um, learners would learn to putt whilst generating random numbers. This was on not, uh, not experienced golfers. And they said that the learners improved when tested under stress. So initially that looks good, but in terms of critique, when they tested these people, they didn't include this secondary task. So what uh, the critiques of this uh, study um, were included that potentially the release from this number generation, the release from this secondary number uh, uh, task allowed them to improve kind of automatically. Um, and it was later shown that the secondary task performed way worse than a normal practice group. So uh, that didn't really make sense. Uh, and it appeared, well, I wouldn't necessarily accuse people of this, that they were selectively, selectively reporting their, their results. Um, finally, when you think about actual coaching techniques, just this idea of distracting somebody from the task in hand doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It's like, all right, okay, you're going to pay me uh, £20 an hour to teach you to do a skill, and I want you to, you know, recite the Lord's prayer backwards or recite the alphabet backwards whilst we're doing it, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's a good way to be learning. So it doesn't really have any face validity. Perilous learning seems to be much more uh, supported. Um, and we know that coaching works. We know that if you if you have a coach present, you, you get better um, rather than trial and error. So some sort of more knowledgeable other present does mean that you that you perform better. Um, but provision of verbal guidance, according to reinvestment theory, along with conditions that promote, and this is important, along with conditions that promote rumination and hypothesis testing. And we know that if you fail, you're more likely to ruminate on your performance verbally. If you lose a game, you're more likely to replay it in your mind than if you win a game. What that does is it allows, therefore, this buildup of declarative motor knowledge in a verbal, um, in a verbal channel that wouldn't, even if the coach isn't providing it, if players fail, then they're more likely to encode verbally and therefore they're more likely to choke in the future. So clearly, if we can limit this failure condition, that makes logical sense. So removing failure is suggested theoretically as, as a potential way to to help beginners learn however the removing of all failure is very difficult to either explain to people and it's a very difficult concept uh, maxwell had a look at this and said high or low error so uh, one group were at the uh, i think from memory these these the people in the low error were very close to the hole, or even there wasn't a, a, a golf hole when they, when they practiced to start with, whereas the high effect people were, were quite a long way away and they were unlikely to ever get a large amount of success. So yes, no, novice golfers, these were people with no experience. So they either started that hole and got further away, or they started from a long way away and got closer. Um, and that it was the initial failure rate that Maxwell and Master, sorry, Maxwell et al. suggested were, was relevant to learning. 
the error less learning maps the errorful learnings on, on a putting task. Uh, this is a novel putting task, so not one that, that, that was particularly relevant to what they'd be learning. Perhaps it had some uh, uh, slopes in there or something. But the key bit that Maxwell suggested is that when under distraction um, and over a period of time, the people who learnt in errorless situations were more effective. So if you just tested them, you put them out on the golf course under normal circumstances, both methods made sense. However, if you put them under stressful situations, perhaps they were being observed by people, which we know causes some people anxiety, or they were distracted by something, then if you had made fewer errors in your learning, then you were less likely to choke under pressure or suffer a degradation in performance. So what this suggests is that implicit knowledge both persists over time and can be effective through distraction. So once again, this is this is clearly has relevance for our, uh, our coaching and once again points towards keeping the verbal channel and uh, keeping errors out of early learning. Um, this is also relevant in rugby. So if you start really, really close together and just pass each other the ball, and then uh, you throw the ball um, very short distances to start with, as opposed to throwing it a long distance and then coming in, but dropping the ball all the time. And what you find under time pressure is that the rugby passes are more accurate and hold up better under time. Last bit, I think, on uh, errorless learning. Follow-up study, Poulton said that um, without explicit instruction, uh, any kind of error reduction leads to a more robust performance over time and through distraction. So there's further evidence there. They suggested that um, when you look at errorless and errorful conditions, uh, this continues to be the case. What they found was that when you're looking at second, secondary cognitive load, which can be things like random number generation or people asking them questions, they also found that there are less learners to perform better. So when you're thinking of something else and you've learned with errors in the past, you're more likely to continue to make errors. Whereas if you've learned error in an errorless form, particularly low verbal, then the idea is that your, your memory trail or your motor movement program is much more robust and therefore it, it, it the suggestion is that neuro, neurologically it goes through a different channel. So the verbal stuff is kept apart from, from the movement stuff, and therefore you can do them both at the same time. Whereas if, you're, if, you're, if you've made errors, you're more likely to ruminate, more likely to hypothesis, test, more likely to lay down further verbal information. You're trying to push the verbal information from the distractor task and the verbal information from the movement task through the same part of the brain, then you're going to see a reduction in performance. So once again, they focus a lot on initial learning of motor skills. Uh, rather than keep the verbal to a minimum, what they're saying is um, it should definitely be done under implicit conditions, which means shut up and let them practice, but don't let them make errors. So let them do things in the absence of error. So if you're looking for a pass in football, perhaps have them pass in, but pass it towards a wall or a curtain or something that's going to deaden the ball. Don't get them thinking about accuracy immediately. Get them used to the skill. Meanwhile, you can be talking to them, but just get them used to putting the feet in the right place. They do then suggest that actually subsequent learning, so once you're into the associative autonomous stage, you can use much more explicit methods or verbal methods because the skill, the motor program is embedded and it doesn't stop you refining it effectively. It just stops you learning it um, when you're an absolute beginner. So this appears uh, much more helpful to the coaching context. We can, we can certainly think of situations where we can take beginners and prevent them from making errors and also not involve them too much on technical chats or technical information in an explicit way. Um, therefore, there is a role for coaching later on uh, in the refining of the movement programme and, and an exploration in the context of a game, perhaps. 
where we can deal with the athletes in an explicit or verbal way um, as long as we avoid it in that initial uh, in that initial uh, learning zone. Last thing, uh, analogy learning. Um, when we don't want them to think necessarily about what their body's doing and therefore create verbal rules that they can regress to, what we can do is give them an analogy, and this crops up quite a lot in sport or a biomechanical metaphor. Um, so in my sport in badminton, we deal with things like L shapes. Uh, the, the Usain Bolt pose is a very good analogy. But also, if you think about hitting a shuttle, the same in tennis serve, if you if you pull back, the, if you imagine pulling back an arrow whilst holding a bow in your non-racket hand, then that gets you into a good position too. There's all manner of them. Uh, in hockey, you've got, uh, I think it's round the clock um, metaphors in, in um, and in rugby, there are several too. So here's an example from another slightly flippant example from uh, films. Inning. I'm what? I'm being your goddamn slave is what I'm being, man. Now we made a deal here. So? So? So you're supposed to teach and I'm supposed to learn, remember? For four days, I've been busting my ass. I haven't learned a goddamn thing. Ah, uh, you learned plenty. I learned plenty. I learned how to sand your decks, maybe. I wash your car, paint your house, paint your fence. I learned plenty, right? Uh, not everything is as seen. Oh, bullshit. I'm going home, man. Daniel-san. Daniel-san. What? Come here. Show me sand the floor. I can't move my arm, all right? What are you doing? What are you... Ow! Okay, this bit's a bit creepy, but this is not the bit that I was trying to... Ow, what are you doing? Be patient. Now show me sand the floor. How did you do that? Shut up! Sand the floor. Hmm. Stand up. Show me sand the floor. Sand of floor. Sand of floor. Big sucker. Sand of floor. Sand of floor. Now show me wax on, wax off. Aye. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off. Concentrate. Look at my eye. Lock a hand. Thumb inside. Wax on. Hat. Wax off. Hat. Wax on. Hat. Wax off. Hat. Wax on. Wax off. Push. Show me paint the fence. Up. Down. Up. Down. Up. Done. Other side. Look, I always look, I show me paint the house. Side, side. Lock wrist. Side, side. Side, side. Yes. Show me wax on, wax off. Catch! 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 Show me paint the fence. Catch! Show me side to side. Yes! 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 Show me sand the floor. Hats! Race! 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 Yes! There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. All you need to do is let your uh, force your players into child labour for a series of week, uh, then touch them in appropriate ways, and then attack them, and then everything will be fine. Only in films. However, on a more serious note, 
analogy learning uh, was investigated um, and compared to standard. So what you would expect in a coaching session is move that arm here, move that leg here, do this, do that, as opposed to try and make yourself look like a tree or a baked bean or something like that. Um, what they, what they, the, the, the example they used is a, is a table tennis topspin. So either you would tell them exactly what they need to do through um, describing where the hand needs to be and the grip and, and, and the forearm and the shoulder rotation or whatever. Or they would just say, follow the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. So thinking them, uh, making them think about moving the racket, sorry, the, the paddle or whatever it is in table tennis, um, from the bottom of a, of a triangle up to the top of a triangle along the long side. And they also included a dual task in this, an implicit learning condition. And what they found was that under psychological stress or testing conditions, there was relatively um, little performance detriment for the implicit learning conditions. However, there was for the explicit learning. So what that they would suggest, uh, it's another, once again, it's another master's, uh, another master's paper and it's his theory. So he would be invested in this. But what he would say is that was evidence for reinvestment in that, um, once again, under testing conditions where players are most likely to reinvest, the, the players in that group, the explicit learning group, reinvested because they had access to technical information in the verbal channel. So once again, we've got this idea that analogy learning is as effective as standard uh, implicit learning for beginners, and perhaps this makes it the most accessible way. I wouldn't worry too much about dual task or distraction, but you know, just personally thinking about it in terms of, of my coaching, errorless learning conditions should be possible. You know, make your make your targets really huge. So rather than getting them thrown into a into a hoop that's ten feet away, create a massive hoop that the players are already in. Then you can maybe reduce the size of that that hoop as they seem to be. Um, as they seem to be gaining some sort of success technically, which you don't need to communicate with them, but you can observe them. But the minute that you think, OK, their, their technique seems to be holding up, then you know, just subtly uh, reduce the target size or you can keep the big target so that they're always getting some success and then include the smaller target as well. Um, as we know, however, from uh, achievement goal theory, it would perhaps be uh, not such a great idea to get them to keep a score because then that promotes interpersonal, um, perhaps an ego orientation. So just to summarise uh, how you would incorporate uh, reinvestment and the, and, the, and the situations or the, or the tactics that you've got for coaching when taking reinvestment into account, it sounds like that there, there is good evidence that we have both an explicit way of learning, which goes through a conscious mind, but also an implicit way. So just plenty of practice as a skill over time, um, and you will become highly efficient at it. Uh, a, a good example that I can think of for that is if you are driving and uh, you know a ball or a cat runs out in front of your car, you're incredibly fast at moving your foot onto the brake. However, you've never actually sat down and practiced braking hard with the possible exception of your of your driving test with a few emergency stops however the, the speed at which you're able to move that 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 right foot from the accelerator to the brake is incredibly quick and and that's perhaps because you've made that movement in a much slower motion without necessarily thinking about it so implicitly for many many times and therefore, you're able to accelerate that motion very, very effectively. It's very rare that we that we go for the break and miss it. Um, we also have uh, the problem, perhaps, that some implicit learning uh, means that there is slower progress for the conscious learner, sorry, the cognitive learner. If you tell somebody how to go and do something, they'll go away and do it. If you show them and let them copy you, or if you if you use kind of a, a constraints led approach where you you set up conditions under which good practice or good technique is is supported and let them go away and trial and error, then 
that's or trial and error less then that's uh, slower but the argument is that it's much better in the long term um, implicit knowledge has a number of a uh, number of advantages in that it seems to be relatively robust to either damage or age or indeed psychological stress, therefore uh, far less likely to choke. So I would contend therefore that it's it's um, it's possible uh, with a bit of planning and a bit of knowledge of about how to do it um, to incorporate errorless and analogy techniques into sport at most levels. Um, just in terms of the practical, uh, I want you to think about uh, a five minute micro session uh, and you're all gonna have a bit of a go, but I want you to think of a closed sport within your, within your a closed skill within your sport uh, that you know very well. And I want you to try and regress it back to the point at which it's not possible to make an error. So when you're kicking a ball, perhaps don't kick to a specific target, get them just kicking. The other thing you could try and do is in order to promote a kinesthetic way of learning rather than any kind of uh, verbal encoding, what I would like you to do is try and think of some sort of analogy. Um, there's a couple of examples on Moodle. There's a, there's a good one of uh, a video of um, a, a, a chap teaching a, a young girl how to hit a tennis serve and he breaks the skill down and then gives her a series of analogies let's just check whether it's still there that's the end of this the slide show anyway um i wouldn't want you to just base your coaching around mr miyagi uh, it's around here somewhere if it's not i will have it on moodle by the end of the day and I'll make it really, really clear where it is. No, it looks like it isn't. So, all right, I'll, I'll put a video up and it will appear here at the bottom under our masters, which is one of the papers I was referring to earlier. Um, and I shall see you all Thursday. Any questions, send them through. Oh, one last thing. Um, the essay. The essay is only 2,000 words and the problem with that, as I'm sure you're all aware at level six now, is that that's not a lot. The danger with this essay is that you go on and on and on about defining the theory itself, which is what I don't want you to do. Perhaps the first third at most should be spent defining the concepts, giving me a conceptual framework. The vast majority of the essay that I want you to complete is evaluating the impact or the evidence for the impact of your chosen theory which is going to be um, either uh, self-determination theory or achievement goal theory if you're going to look at motivation reinvestment and the coaching uh, the coaching uh, strategies that, that are predicted or supported by reinvestment um, or if you're going to look at uh, transformational leadership, then what what role, what does that predict? And is there any evidence that those predictions are true in sport coaching? So I want the vast majority, yeah, at least 60, 70 percent of your essay should be on evaluating the theory in the coaching context rather than describing the theory. If you can do that, then your essays will be fine. Uh, Feel free to send me a draft of that essay and I will get feedback to you as soon as I can. OK, so look out for the uh, look out for the link to the video and I will uh, make it available as soon as possible.